Welcome back to another impactful episode of the PSDA podcast. This is Craig King, your favorite host, and I'm also here with your favorite guest. He's probably tired of me using that tagline, but we're here, Patrick. Sorry. Craig, I'll take it. I'm a Buffalo Bills fan in January. I'm happy for any accolade I can get because my team ain't getting it. Well, since you opened that door, my team is getting it. Shout out to the San Francisco 49ers who are not located in South Carolina. Neither are the Buffalo Bills, but, you know, if any teachers out there, if you've grown up in South Carolina, you realize your favorite team is probably in another state. That's right. That's right. And, that you know, there's always next year. <laughs> there's always next year. Well, Patrick, it's been – we just wrapped up uh, week three. Is three. that correct? Yeah. Of the legislative session. And so what's going on? Well, we're starting to see some movement on some education bills. Um, okay. The Senate – passed a bill on Tuesday. They said it's a special order at recommendation of Senate Majority Leader Shane Massey. Um, it's a bill that's been on their calendar since last year, um, S-305, written by Senator Tom Young out of Aiken. Um, and it's a bill that would award work experience credit to an individual on their initial teaching certificate um, if they're coming into teaching from a related industry. So if they've got at least five years of work experience, um, in a related field to their teaching content, they get certified. So this is not a non-certified teacher bill. These are still individuals with certification. Um, it would allow those individuals to get a two-to-one work experience credit on their certificate to increase the step they're on for their initial salary. Um, PSDA thinks this is a great tool to enhance recruitment. Um, this was recommended by the teacher task force last spring. Um, Senate passed it unanimously with strong support from both parties, from members across the state. Um, so now it heads back or heads across to the House, and hopefully it's going to have um, an opportunity to get to the governor's desk this year. Well, that's good. Good to know. And I, and from what we've gathered, teachers are in support of this bill too. Um, yeah, yeah. Our membership was a little divided on what the ratio should right. be. Should mm-hmm. it be one year of experience on your certificate for every year of work-related experience, or should it be the two-to-one? Um, we polled our members on that last spring, and it was almost a 50-50 split. The Senate went with the two-to-one ratio, um, which means that somebody who's been a nurse that's going to come teach a health science class in a high school – Um, If they've been a nurse for 10 years, they're going to start at step five on the salary schedule. Um, The other cool thing about this bill that I was really excited about, on the floor during debate, Senator Vernon Stevens added an amendment that makes it clear that that work experience also extends to individuals that are currently working in schools in a classified instructional role, like a classified assistant, an instructional aide, a paraprofessional. So we know that oftentimes um, those individuals will seek certification later in their career, and they're phenomenal teachers. Some of the best teachers in our state are oftentimes those powerhouse instructional aides in a kindergarten classroom or a special education setting. So under Senator Stevens' amendment, if this thing becomes law, if I've been working as a instructional aide in a special ed classroom for 16 years and I decide, you know what, I'm ready to be the certified teacher of record and I get my certification, I'm going to come in at no less than step eight. Now, a district could do more than that if they wanted to, but I'm coming in at least step eight. I think that's a powerful tool to recognize the expertise and the experience and the value that those classified staff members bring to our schools. Yeah, I agree, Patrick. And and if I was an aide and I saw that as a um, my starting point, I would say, you know what, they are recognizing what I brought to the table uh, for a number of years as an assistant or a parapro. So uh, that's great. Uh, so on your women in advocacy, I noticed uh, you mentioned made mention of uh, Read to Succeed and social media. Yeah. So Read to Succeed is in a Senate Education Subcommittee. Um, it, the bill that they're uh, reviewing right now is S905, which is a new bill introduced this session by Senator Hembree. Um, and this is a continuation of a discussion from last year. Wednesday's subcommittee hearing was exclusively taking feedback from the public. Um, PSTA was the first education association to speak. We spoke in favor of a lot of the provisions in the bill, most significantly the provision that would eliminate the read to succeed courses that are required for recertification. This bill gets rid of those. Um, This year, those courses are frozen for non-elementary and special ed teachers as a one-year budget proviso, but this bill, if law, would get rid of them for everybody. You would no longer have to pay for those read to succeed courses to keep your certificate current. Um, 
We also shared some concerns with the committee and recommendations for improvement, um, one of them being ensuring that kids that are identified for reading interventions in K-1, 2, and 3 are still ensured opportunity to access a well-rounded curriculum of social studies and science and phys- physical education and the arts. Um, and we gave some recommendations on how you could do that um, within a construct of, of literacy interventions. Um, and we also made recommendations around um, funding because this bill would significantly no- increase the number of kids eligible for summer reading camps, which we think is a good thing because that's a great intervention tool and a great resource, but it comes with a cost and with districts running out of federal COVID relief money, increasing the number of kids in reading camps without a corresponding increase in state appropriations, we're worried could have a really detrimental impact on district budgeting procedures. For sure. Um, You know, I I don't want to get into the weeds of uh, salary schedules, but what I want our members listening to do is go back to last week's episode because Patrick and I spent a great deal of time on that topic, specifically laying out some of the facts, what the proposal from the governor is, what it is not, uh, what it does include, what it does not include. And so, but Patrick, if you want to share anything around that topic, you can, but I I would highly encourage our members to go back and listen to last week's episode uh, when we had a really, um, in-depth conversation about it. Yeah, I mean, a few things that I think I'd emphasize based on feedback from members from that land and from news reports and and what they've heard, individuals are hearing within schools. Um, As we said last week, again, it's a proposal. This is not a bill. There is no legislation. Um, And so as individuals are reaching out to their member of the House, I would encourage you to reference the executive budget proposal. Do not talk about the bill that would change teacher salary schedules simply because it gets confusing for the representative. They got to keep up with hundreds of pieces of legislation. And if you're rep- re- referencing a bill, but there's not actually a bill, that gets really confusing for them. And you want them focusing on the substance of what you're saying, not the technical aspects of is it a bill? Is it a proposal? What are we talking about? Um, the second thing I'd emphasize is a I cannot overemphasize this. What is in the LAN and what is in the executive budget proposal is a recommendation for the statewide minimum salary schedule. Right. And currently, 60-plus districts in South Carolina pay above the statewide minimum. So I was talking to a colleague this morning um, on my way out of Blythewood High when I got done teaching, and she made reference to, you know, she had looked carefully at the governor's proposal and she looked at her current paycheck and she said, well, it looks like I'd come out about $4,000 behind on the governor's salary schedule, but I understand that the hold harmless is there and so I wouldn't see any pay increase this year. And and we looked further and and looking at the district salary schedule, that 4000 is probably closer to about 1500 Now, that's still less money. Don't get me wrong. Right. But the governor's proposing a statewide minimum, and if your district's already paying beyond that statewide minimum, there is nothing in the governor's budget that would require your district to revert to the statewide minimum. The governor's always proposed statewide minimums with districts having the capacity to pay above, and not only are districts not required to revert back to the governor's proposal, the governor's proposing $250 million in increased funding to districts, and, and the governor's office is, is estimating that those increased, that the, the statewide increase would have a price tag around $160 million or so. So there's ample amounts of increased state funding to cover the full state portion, which means districts should, in theory, be able to maintain their local portion. Now, there's there's other factors there in terms of local property tax base and some other things, but you need to make the comparison to your district schedule whenever you possibly can because that's going to give you a better grounding. Now, that doesn't mitigate the fact that, as we've pointed out in the lands for the last two weeks, three weeks, People in the master's plus 30 and doctorate lanes come out behind over time because of the reduction in lanes from five to two. And yes, there's the hold harmless, so you you are zero in effect. But those lanes, even when you start accounting for the district increases and supplements, the the elimination of those lanes could still potentially have a significant financial impact on the individuals in those lanes but you'll get a better apples-to-apples comparison if you take your district schedule 
and, and probably the easiest way to do this is look at your the starting pay on your district schedule. Mm-hmm. The statewide minimum right now is forty two five. So if your district is already paying, let's say, a starting pay of forty five thousand. Your district's already $2,500 beyond what the state is recommending. Take what the governor's proposing for next year with a starting pay of $45,000, wrap it up $2,500. Now, district doesn't have to do that. That's their choice. They could just freeze it at forty five dollars and not change anything as long as they're above the statewide minimum. But the governor's not telling them they have to. That then becomes a district decision. That's great. Uh, information Patrick for our members and and just take the time to listen at that conversation we had uh, last week but also what Patrick shared today uh, as it relates to the proposal not legislation not a bill just a proposal uh, from the governor's office and so when you reach out to your representatives um, you can reference the proposal from the governor's office Um, anything else you want to share with our members um, upcoming this week week four the only thing I'd, I'd reference just tying a bow on the salary schedule conversation is a lot of members have reached out. I know this yeah. because I can see it in our system. I know this because uh, last Wednesday I had a legislator who doesn't typically ask about salaries in January, not because he doesn't care, but because he's not on the budget writing committee. Mm-hmm. But he was already asking me about, well, what's going on with teacher salaries? Because he's been hearing from PSTA members. Um, so that's great. Keep it up. What I would emphasize is if you have not shared your voice yet, you're running out of time to do so because the week of February 17th, the House Ways and Means Committee will introduce their budget. Now, that that bill, then it will be a bill. It'll have a number. It'll be a piece of legislation. It can be amended by the Ways and Means Committee, by the full House, by the Senate, finance, by the Senate. The governor could veto something. It's still a long way from the finish line. But the way the state budget process works with $13 billion in general fund revenue and spending is the big ticket items. And there are few tickets in the state budget bigger than teacher salary and fringe benefits. They get hard to change the closer we get to the finish line simply because the state, unlike the federal government, is constitutionally required to run a balanced budget. You know, Congress... If they, if they find out, oh, we, we actually needed more money, they can just borrow it, and we can have a whole <laughs> different discussion about the national debt some other yeah. time and come to my AP government class. But the state can't do that. And so if the Ways and Means Committee introduces a budget that incorporates large portions of what the governor's proposing, yes, it can still be amended in the legislative process, but it becomes incredibly difficult to do so the further along it gets because any change to one big big ticket item, whether it's an increase in spending or a decrease in spending, has to be married with an offsetting big ticket change somewhere else in the budget. Makes sense. That's Mm -hmm. easy to do if we're talking about a $100,000 community park. Right. But if you're talking about a multi-billion dollar funding stream for teacher salaries and fringe benefits, it's hard to change the direction of that ship um, last year, I think everybody saw the the memes of the ship that got stuck in the Suez Canal or wherever yeah. it was because mm-hmm. you couldn't turn to the left or the right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The big ticket items in the state budget get a lot like that ship in a canal by the time it enters. Right now, the ship's not in the canal yet. But come February 17th, it is entering the canal and it gets harder to move. So if you haven't reached out and you're concerned about this, the time is now. And you're on the clock. you got three weeks. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. And uh, thanks for... Uh, the update on everything coming up and go 49ers. Sorry, Bills. Um, hopefully your next team year. listening <laughs> next year. <laughs> hopefully your team is in the Super Bowl, but hopefully my team wins the Super Bowl. So this yeah. is. <laughs> hey, it, it, uh, but who won was America because we got another week of Taylor and Jason and Travis and yep. all the Kelsey's and everybody. Yep. It's, it's all coming. I saw that American Airlines has already created I a Kansas that. City to Vegas flight, and the flight number is 1989, uh, and, and the return flight is yeah, 87. Right. Well played, American Airlines. Hey, what about the 49ers? Santa Clara to Vegas, can we get something, please? Probably not, because we're not Taylor Swift. But anyway. No, no. It's been Sorry. another impactful episode of the PSA Podcast. I'm Craig King, your host, and I'll talk to you soon.